Okay. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. All right, we just had to switch computers. I don't know what happened with the old one. I just got off another Zoom call too. I'm so glad it's working. That's great. So nice to have you, sir. Good. Thank you for having me. No, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, we should start, Tasha, whenever you are. Bye. We are live. Perfect. Hey, Ruben. Hi, leader. How you doing? I'm good. <laughs> I'm assuming you're in California? No, actually, I haven't made it back yet. I'm still here on the east. We're making, we're making you work hard, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're, we're ready to begin. All right. We're live, Robert. Yes, yes. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Robert Rook, CEO of Alliance for Safety and Justice. Alliance for Safety and Justice is a national organization that consists of crime survivors, people with convictions, and the organizations that serve them. We have 80,000 members across the country, all working towards replacing over incarceration with more effective solutions rooted in prevention, community health, rehabilitation, economic stability, and support for crime victims. We partner with state leaders in large states to reform safety and justice laws through campaigns, coalitions, and communications. The issue we are here to discuss today could not be more important. A discussion on how to access federal stimulus funding to support health, safety, and recovery in our communities. I want to begin by thanking our co-sponsors, the Board of Hispanic Chairs, Caucus Chairs, and Noble Women, and deep appreciation to the speakers we have today. Today, we are honored to have Representative Karen Bass of California and the Chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. We're also excited to have Representative Ruben Gallego of Arizona, the first vice chair of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Next, we have Representative Mark Takano, second vice chair, Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, and Illinois House Deputy Majority Leader, State Representative Jahan Gordon Booth, who will share our case study today. Lastly, Lieutenant Governor of Michigan Garland Gilchrist will close with a summary and call to action. Many across the U.S. are starting to call attention to the long skewed priorities of a country that has 3 million prison and jail beds and only 924,000 hospital beds. The reality is a direct result of a history of policies and practices that have systemically neglected the same communities dying disproportionately of COVID-19 today. We know that misplaced priorities has led to what we are experiencing today, but what can we do about it? Our goal with this forum is to share information about funding stimulus plans, what can be done with it, focusing on an important emerging strategy out of Illinois. Each guest will share their perspective in five minutes and we'll leave 20 minutes for presentations and Q&A. Before we begin with our first panelist, we have a special guest who would like to say a few words. Thank you. I want to thank the Alliance for Safety and Justice for all the work you do. Lenora Anderson, my longstanding friend, Robert Rooks, thank you. You are bringing together leaders like members of Congress, Karen Bass and Mark DeCano and Ruben Gallego, together with the CBC, the CHC, KPAC, and so many others to shine a light on the long-standing inequities that have existed against Black, Brown, and AAPI communities that have only been highlighted during the 
this pandemic. I thank you for the work you do. Let's keep fighting together to fight for justice, for equality and safety for all communities. Thank you so much, Senator Harris. Now we will hear from our representatives from the U.S. House of Representatives. First, we'll begin with Representative Karen Bass, then Representative Ruben Gallego, and Mark Ticano, Representative Mark Ticano. Now I'll hand it over to the Honorable Karen Bass. Well, thank you so much, uh, Robert. Thank you for the work of the organization you are working on. I believe one of the most important issues of our time, one of the most important areas of inequity. And of course, this is really, really magnified given the pandemic. You know, from day one, the Congressional Black Caucus was very much concerned about mass incarceration, period. But the idea that you have hundreds of thousands of people in our prisons and jails around the country really amount to them being in what you would refer to as a petri dish. While you have the uh, Center for Disease Control talking about social distancing and hand washing, we know what goes on in our prisons. And so we have from the very beginning called for the early release and early release in a number of different categories, depending on a person's age, their health status, uh, women, especially pregnant women. I mean, women typically are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses to begin with, so why are they there? And then children. Uh, we don't use the term juveniles because I think we need to be clear we are talking about children, children who are in federal custody. And so on both of the bills, we have called for this. On the CARES bill that we voted for early on, uh, there was recommendations to the Board of Prisons that they conduct early release, lease. The thing we have been calling for, though, also is massive testing. How do you not test mm -hmm. people in a Petri dish? And not just the inmates, but also the guards and everybody else that works in the prison. So we called for that. We know that the Board of Bureau of Prisons has not really done that. And so in this last bill that we voted on, we kicked it up to, be, uh, to have it be mandated. We've done a couple of calls on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus with families who have relatives that are incarcerated. And so uh, we wanted to hear from them. Uh, we did one of the calls with congressional leaders, with the speaker, the majority leader, uh, et cetera, so they could hear the stories of the relatives. The other thing is at the same time as we're calling for the early release, we also have to call for massive amounts of funds to the Second Chance Act, because it's one thing to tell people, or it's one thing for people to be released, but what are they being released to? So all of the grassroots organizations that are doing re-entry work need to be boosted at this point in time. Uh, we do feel good that in the last bill, we did get some of that. We got it mandated. We, we got, uh, I think it was $300 million in for Second Chance Act. I think much more than that can be done, but we do think that it has been a, um, a good uh, first and second step. And in addition to that, we have been fighting for the release of individuals as we uh, hear. One of the things that the Bureau of Prisons was doing was they were uh, telling people they were gonna be released and then reneging on that. The other thing that I wanna say is that the Congressional Black Caucus has been focusing on the disproportionate death rate of African Americans. And frankly, it's disproportionate death rate of African Americans, of Latinos, and particularly in the API community of Pacific Islanders. We fight together, we are unified. Uh, there's not daylight between our three caucuses. You, sh you should know that. And we call it the Tri-Caucus Plus Two because we include our two Native American sisters uh, as well. And so we are calling for focused intervention in areas where there's the disproportionate death rate. It is unacceptable to me to hear about all these comorbidities we have because it's almost like saying, hey, you guys got all this stuff going on, you're a hot mess, there's nothing we can do. I think that is an excuse. We can intervene and we can deal with this now. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing the call. Uh, I think it's gonna take real community response to fight for these changes. One last thing I wanna say about the disproportionate death rate, how ironic it is that we would release people from prison who would go straight to the zip codes where the death rate is disproportionate. So that is also why we need to make sure that people are taken care of before they leave uh, prison in addition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Baez. I, I understand that you have to leave us, uh, so I would love to ask you a question, if that's okay. Sure. 
Uh, so the, the HEROES Act uh, will help address uh, some of the gaps and challenges with CARES uh, and provide resources for crime victims, for people with felony convictions, for people in need in some of the same communities you just spoke on. Here on this uh, uh, forum, you have let state legislators from across uh, the country. What, what can they do? How can they help you uh, get the HEROES Act across the finish line? Well, I think, you know, one of the big pieces of the HEROES Act was uh, funding for states and for, lo for local areas. And at this point in time, I do believe our Republican colleagues in the Senate will move, but for whatever reason, they feel there hasn't been enough pain. They want the mm -hmm. situation to get worse, and then they will move. And so I think that it is very important on behalf of the states that they need to clamor. Well, they need to clamor with what is happening and what are the consequences, because we know that first responders are affected if you don't fund the states and the locals. And so I think illustrating those examples, putting them out there in the public, going on the press and saying, this is what is happening. We know that the administration has decided to adopt magical thinking. And they're just going to say, hey, you know, I mean, we need to just go back to work. It's kind of like once they saw who was dying, well, then, you know, what's, we don't really have a problem here. We need to, you know, get everybody back, uh, back to work and the economy working. So I think clamoring with the examples of what is happening when the states and the cities uh, and counties are losing resources is the best thing that they could do. Wonderful. Thank you, Representative Bass. Thank you so much for doing this. Our next speaker is Representative Ruben Gallego. Representative Gallego. Thank you, and you know, thank you for organizers, and thank you uh, for Representative Bass for, for speaking on behalf of CBC. And the CBC really is the soul and conscious of the Democratic Caucus, uh, and uh, we are so lucky to have them in alliance and fighting, you know, the historic inequities that have been going on both in the African American community and communities of color in general. And you know, if anything that showed us COVID nineteen has really exposed those inequities. Uh, you know, it really exposed, you know, the, the structural racism that has caused the Latino community, the African community, and our API community to be some of the largest victims of COVID-19. Uh, and the fact that now, not only are they ignoring uh, how it's affecting our communities, when I say they, the administration, they're also forcing our people to go and basically work uh, in, and actually put themselves on the line. It's very insulting. Uh, I think for a lot of us in the tri caucus, when we see, you know, the 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 meat plants and the chicken plants uh, in the north and the south, where it's you know, brown brothers and brown sisters that are exposing themselves to COVID-19, that have high infections rates, and yet they don't have health insurance, they get paid, uh, you know, barely uh, minimum wage, and that's really hard work. I, I actually grew up in in Chicago on the south side, ironically enough, uh, 55th and, and Western. Uh, and worked at meatpacking factories in Chicago in high school. It is horrible work. And it's largely black and Latino families that are working in these uh, uh, factories. Uh, and right now this administration is taking over these factories, uh, putting them on the DPA, the Defense Protection Act, not give, basically making them essential workers, but not make, treating them like essential workers. They're not getting health insurance. They're not getting tested a lot of times. Uh, and if they quit, uh, they are not gonna be eligible for uh, uh, unemployment. And God bless you if you're undocumented and you're working and you get sick, you're not getting anything, right? So this is the kind of work that we're trying to do, you know, in the Tri-Caucus. Uh, we're trying to basically protect uh, the working, true working class of this, of this country. And that's people of color. It's Black people, Latinos, and API community that have continued working when everything shut down. They're the ones that are still at the grocery store and they're still the ones that are meat processing our food, they're still are driving, it's largely the working class people of color uh, that have kept this country going, and yet we are not doing anything, in our opinion, now we are doing some stuff with the stimulus bill, but this administration is not doing anything to recognize it, and they're not even doing anything to recognize the fact that we have higher morbidity because of uh, COVID-19, uh, and it's, it's disturbing, uh, you know, and, and now we, we go into the, you know, our, our levels of incarceration, you know, just because you're incarcerated does not make you uh, does not make you non-human. It doesn't give us government's license to treat them as they're non-human. Uh, you know, I think unfortunately, many of us, my, my family included, I have you know, growing up, I knew more people in my family that were in jail than, than that went to college. 
you know, that did not make them any less of my cousins, did not make them any less of a person. My father is including that community. Uh, you know, they still deserve the opportunity to come out uh, of this, uh, you know, with, with health and hopefully an opportunity to rehabilitate themselves. Uh, you know, going to jail should not be a death sentence. It should be an opportunity to rehabilitate yourself. And obviously we haven't treated it that way. Even so, without even looking at the, those people that have been convicted, we still have, you know, hundreds of thousands of families or family members that are in jail just because they can't pay cash bail. A, a system that has been existing for hundreds of years that should be uh, gotten rid of. And the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of families, men and women, largely uh, of color, that are in jail because they can't pay cash bill while they're waiting for trial is absolutely ridiculous. It should be unconstitutional. Uh, and your tri caucus is also trying to get rid of that. And right now, if someone is in jail because they can't pay bail and they haven't actually gone to, to a jury, haven't been convicted uh, with the outbreak of COVID-19, we're basically giving them a, a death sentence, right? That's just wrong, right? So steps like that we need to address. You have, we've gone a long way in this last uh, stimulus bill to actually address a lot of these inequities. Uh, but you know, in going more into the future, we have to just continually to keep pushing forward because the structural problems that exist uh, in this country, once we get rid of uh, COVID-19, are still gonna be there. And every time there's a new pandemic, it's gonna be the same people that get hit on over and over again. It's gonna be black Latino communities, black and Latino communities and API communities, the workers of this country that are always gonna get hit because we can't hide. Our communities can't hide in their homes because if they hide in their homes, they can't feed their families. Uh, and that's just gonna continue going uh, that. So we have to get out of uh, this you know, pandemic and then we have to go back and actually fix the structural problems that made us so vulnerable during this pandemic. Uh, thank you, by the way, again, for having me and uh, you know, I'll gladly also stick around for questions too. Thank you so much, Representative Gallego. Next, we'll have Representative Mark Takano. There you go. I think you're muted. There you go. It was, it was, it was on mute. It was muted before. Well, good <laughs> afternoon. Good afternoon. God forbid a, uh, a member of Congress being muted. Um, uh, I'm Congressman Mark Takano. I'm here, I'm here on behalf of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, and I'm really pleased to join such a diverse uh, panel to discuss the many disparate impacts that COVID-19 is having on communities of color. I'm particularly delighted uh, to be with my colleague, uh, Ruben Gallego. Um, you know, always been a voice not only for uh, Hispanic and Latinos in America, but, you know, a progressive voice in the Congress uh, to, to uh, fight back and push back against the structural inequities. And uh, I know Karen had to leave, uh, but what an amazing voice, uh, an effective voice she's been uh, on, uh, you know, issues about prisons and uh, 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 foster youth and uh, just all that we need to do in, in order to address uh, the, the persistent and lingering inequalities that are, that are attributable to race. Um, many AAPIs have been facing heightened uh, discrimination since the beginning of this pandemic. We've seen elected officials double down on racist rhetoric when referring to COVID-19, including the President of the United States himself. And not only have some members of his own party uh, uh, aid, aided and abetted him uh, in that regard. I mean, they've not, they've not, uh, uh, they've not just sort of looked away. Uh, they have actively participated uh, in uh, the kind of uh, stereotypical characterizations uh, of Asian Americans and connected them to the kind of mass blame and mass guilt that results uh, in others in America being emboldened to verbally and physically threaten and harass people of Asian descent. In fact, a report by the Asian Pacific Policy and Planning Council has documented more than a thousand instances of discrimination related to coronavirus, uh, often violent instances. Uh, and this, given that this is Asian Pacific Heritage Month, it's a great time to elevate uh, these issues of the API community. And in times like this, we really do need to call out racism and remind 
the American people uh, that words have power. Uh, and not doing so would be a failure of political leadership with serious and long lasting consequences. And I do have to pay a compliment to the leadership of uh, the chairwoman of the Congressional Asian Pacific Caucus, Judy Chu. Uh, she, in a caucus call, made it very clear uh, to the Democratic Caucus uh, that anyone signing on to a piece of legislation which would have further legitimized the use of the term coronavirus or China virus, or that the idea that the virus originated uh, to get China to, uh, to admit, quote unquote admit, that the virus started in China. Obviously it started there, but it was a mean piece of legislation. I'm very proud to say that no member of the Democratic Caucus signed on to that piece of legislation. And that was because uh, members of the AAP, of, of, of KPAC, uh, backed by the Tri Caucus, uh, made it clear that we weren't gonna stand uh, for that kind of, of um, uh, that kind of legislation. So this pandemic is already, as, as has been said, has already exacerbated the already distinct obstacles that my members of the minority communities face on a daily basis. We know that the increased incarceration rates among certain AAPI populations is overlooked due to inadequate data. There's not enough disaggregated data about the AAPI community. Um, and if you look at the AAPI, I, I, AAPI community as one uh, undifferentiated mass, uh, you're not going to see very important patterns occurring in, in subgroups. Um, so there's inadequate data. We know that minority communities are not receiving federal funding that accurately re represents the composition and diversities of these very same communities, furthered by Republican attacks on the census. Uh, it's important that we remember that you know these attacks on the census have an end in mind. Uh, we know that minority populations are getting sick from COVID-19 at much higher rates. Congress must address the systematic, the systematic dis, uh, injustices that have been exposed by the public health crisis that we all already know pre-existed of the public health crisis. This will require bold action by the federal government and I'm proud to say that we took some bold steps uh, to provide immediate relief to every American last Friday by passing the HEROES Act in the House. The HEROES Act, which, uh, which the Democrats fiercely have advocated for, works, for uh, works to address some of these challenges our communities are facing. Uh, and KPAC, along with uh, uh, the uh, CHC and uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, included a host of our own priorities. Specifically in this bill, we require uh, that uh, this bill requires HHS to report disaggregated COVID-19 testing, diagnosing, diagnosis, and hospitalization data by race, ethnicity, sex, and other crucial factors. So, so important, without this data, we cannot show what is actually happening. Second, it directs Health and Human Services to carry out culturally appropriate awareness campaigns and help counter the stigma associated with the virus. Thirdly, provides an additional $75 billion for, for testing, contact tracing, and isolation measures to better support uh, communities that are experiencing some of the highest COVID-19 infection and mortality rates. Fourth, it makes COVID-19 <laughs> treatment free for those with Medicare Parts A and B and Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, as well as private insurance. And it allows immigrant, this is really important, immigrant taxpayers uh, to, and it's important, immigrants pay taxes to access cash relief benefits with an ITIN. Uh, and closes gaps uh, in the CARES Act that prevented uh, mixed status households from receiving cash uh, relief payments. Now there are a host of other provisions included in the HEROES Act that were uh, included to the benefit of working families and minority com communities across the country. And we'll continue fighting to make sure that these priorities remain in the agreed upon legislation with the Senate. Now a pillar of the HEROES Act is the more than $1 trillion that is provided to aid states and local governments in shoring up their response to the virus. State and local governments can ensure that relief money gets to where it's needed most. Uh, and so this funding in the HEROES Act is absolutely critical. It's also important that Congress perform the oversight over the distribution of these funds to ensure that they're distributed equitably and reach the communities that they're often overlooked. Black communities, Hispanic communities, 
Native American communities, and AAPI communities. And I want to mention one more thing. Uh, uh, Peter uh, DeFazio, who chairs the uh, House uh, Transportation Committee, uh, told me that getting FEMA uh, to waive its normal 25% cost share with the states is a huge deal. As chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee, I know that cer certain state governors are are facing huge state budget deficits uh, where the VA could go in and help private nursing homes and help prisons actually uh, deal with testing and um, uh, infection, per, uh, you know, uh, 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 managing infections within a congregate housing, which is what private nursing homes are, which is what state nursing homes are, which is what prisons are. Um, they're balking because of that 25% cost share. Uh, we need to get that story out, that we need to get uh, this bill passed because this bill will waive that cost share. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, I really look forward to, to, to an informative discussion about how government can step, uh, step in, the federal government, uh, at all levels uh, to ensure that our communities have the resources and support they need to make it through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Takano. So good and refreshing to have leadership like we have in Congress, <clears throat> excuse me, during times like this. Uh, we're also seeing leadership show up in a major way at the state level, even on this call. We have representatives from the Black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Caucus in states like Arizona, California, Florida, Illinois, Louisiana, Michigan, New York State. New York City, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Texas. So it's just good to be amongst friends and good company. It's now my great pleasure to introduce one of the most effective champions for our work in the country. My friend, my colleague, Deputy Majority Leader of the Illinois State House of Representatives, Representative Jahan Gordon Booth. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Robert, you're too kind. Um, thank you all so much for including me in this conversation. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not thank uh, you, Robert, in particular, um, and Lenora with the Alliance for Safety and Justice for your tireless work to elevate um, Black and Brown leadership and people all over this country and lifting up conversations around justice and access to opportunity. Uh, for our communities. And I must admit, I've been in politics for the last 12 years. And until I met you all in your organization, I've, I haven't, I had not met anyone like you before, and I have not let, met anyone like you since. And so I really want to lift you all up in this space as well, because you all are um, certainly catalysts for change all over this country. Um, as Robert articulated, my name is Jahan Gordon Booth, and I am the Deputy Majority Leader of the Illinois House of Representatives. Uh, I happen to be the first black woman and the youngest person to serve um, in this role. I have been working tirelessly and very closely with uh, our governor here in Illinois, Governor Bibi Pritzker, alongside um, my brothers and sisters in the Black Caucus um, to respond to the myriad of issues uh, that communities are facing in the wake of this pandemic. I think that our experiences here in Illinois are notable really for two reasons, um, two key reasons. One, Illinois is more representative demographically of this country than any other state in the nation. And I want folks to in the last presidential race. Um, Illinois and Chicago in particular was the focus of much conversation <clears throat> because of the unsolved violent crime of which uh, Black people were falling victim to. Four years later, as we enter into this next presidential cycle, Chicago and Black lives are at the forefront as we see staggering and racial disparity in the death rates from COVID. These trends are inextricably linked. And because of this system of divestment that has been in place for far too long in places like Chicago and Illinois, in places like you all represent all over the country. 
Um, it is it is my firm belief that we have reached an inflection point in the response to COVID, uh, where we are transitioning from just talking about this as a public health centered issue, but to one where we have to begin to include um, a plan that is going to be far more equitable in restoring our economy, uh, to drive a pathway for centers in creating value and opportunity for the work that our communities do to sustain our local communities and the larger state economy. Um, as Representative um, Takamo said earlier, some of the challenges that we are facing um, in states as it relates to our state budgets, they are staggering. Um, and I wanna thank the congressional members for their assistance in passing uh, the most recent uh, stimulus package. We hope that the Senate will take that up because we certainly need those, those supports in our community. And I cannot, I can't lift that up enough. Thank you so much. Um, but like past eras of recession, we are in a time when the federal government is prepared to make large investments that are very difficult for local governments and state governments to make from a social and an economic standpoint. But as the federal government prepares to make those investments, um, there are three things that I think that we should also be considering. And if you look at um, one of the reasons why ASJ is so amazing as an organization, they're not just a grassroots organization with boots on the ground but they also have some of the most amazing data and research um, from any organization in the country. And if you look at some of the research that ASJ, you can easily find it on their website. Um, it shows that if you are thinking, if you're looking at what's happening in communities, if you look at what's happening in states, um, the critical assistance that's being made available um, because of the federal government, we should be looking at directing um, those immediate and basic uh, resources in a couple of ways. Obviously, we are still going to be in need um, of PPE as, we, as many states around the country are deliberating the opening. The more businesses come back online to 20% capacity, 50% capacity and beyond, the more PPE needs um, that there will be um, for, from everything to, to, to schools to even some of the most basic um, some of the most basic interactions that one may have, but also the need for technology to facilitate social distancing, um, the need and uh, access to safe housing. One of the things that really stands out for me is when I saw the CARES Act and particularly the BGA stimulus fund, I knew where we could utilize uh, these resources and provide additional help and support to local organizations that are doing the work, the real work on the ground that all of us are talking about as it relates to the things that we care about. Um, and Congress certainly mandated that these BGA, that these BGA funds in the CARES Act, it's, it's incredibly clear, right? The appropriation says that the funds must help state and local jurisdictions prevent, prepare, and respond to the coronavirus. And so um, those funds here in Illinois, we have something called the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority. And oftentimes, the, uh, we call them ICG. ICG becomes a flow through and a pass through from for a lot of federal funds. And when uh, those funds were identified, uh, we knew that the work that ASJ was doing, the Illinois Sure Safety Coalition had been doing. I knew that clearly that there were going to be significant alliances between the work that the Illinois Sure Safety Coalition was doing and the Black Caucus. And so. Um, the work that I do with my brothers and sisters in the caucus, I brought this issue to them and asked, and I shared with them a strategy for being able to identify those resources and make a very strong suggestion that those resources um, should be diverted to the communities and organizations that need those resources the most. And because of the coalition that ASJ has worked so hard to bring together of, of survivors, of uh, domestic violence survivors, sexual assault survivors, as well as community um, violence survivors were all able to come together and, um, and assure that 60% of those resources are gonna be spent in communities closest to the people that are, that are the most harmed and the least served. And so I just wanted to share, come quickly and share that story because those funds, we would be going into the summer months uh, where we all know that violence in most of our communities, when we have our most significant challenges, um, 
those funds for that reason and for so many other reasons, those resources would not be there had it not been for obviously the work of our congressional, um, our congressional delegation that's on the call right now and also the work of some amazing advocates along with Alliance for Safety and Justice. So I wanna thank you all for um, being real awesome teammates in this work. Thank you so much, Leader Bruce. Uh, the relevance of federal actions to state governments, uh, the vulnerability that we all have witnessed and experienced in communities, um, and then how you've been able to come together to assure that 60% of those funds go to uh, the community is, is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and for those that are watching and listening, you can uh, uh, send your question through the chat because uh, now we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. What questions do you have about what you've heard? Uh, what do you want to dive more into? Um, as part of that, uh, we have been able to identify our first uh, question for the evening. Um, and it's coming from the great state of Ohio. Uh, Representative Stephanie House is from the Ohio Black Caucus and she uh, has asked, um, as the head of the Ohio Black uh, Caucus, what is the best way for us to get federal dollars to come to crime survivors and people returning home from prison to help them all be safe and healthy? So who would like to take that on? Thank you. Thank you, Representative House. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So look, we did put some funding, obviously, um, as, as Representative Bass uh, spoke, we did put some funding uh, into the last um, uh, stimulus bill regarding this. Uh, but there is an ongoing project uh, in terms of funding that needs to continue. Uh, and it will have to continue into the next administration. We have, you know, fallen behind because of sequestration over the last couple of years in terms of, of bringing funding for uh, second step uh, uh, programs. Uh, so I recommend a couple of things. Number one, in the time while we're doing the stimulus coronavirus bills, I really encourage you to contact your members of Congress and making sure that we consistently put even more and more funding into the next uh, amount of stimulus that keep coming up. And the reason that matters is because I fear, and I'm sure everyone here has seen this before, as states start cutting uh, funds because they're losing their tax base, they're going to go and start funding some of these, you know, cut first some of these uh, rehabilitation programs. I think that is just going to be horrendous because once you cut them, it's difficult for you to get those funds back. It'll take years to do it. So number one, uh, as I don't have to tell you that you're a state, your state leader or state representative already. So make sure you, you take care on that end. But on the, on the federal level, make sure that you are contacting your, your delegation, making sure that they're putting it also uh, in there and that it's mandated that it's used by the state for those purposes. We don't want states, especially some of these red leaning states to repurpose that money into something else. And I've seen it happen here in Arizona. So anyone else? I think Representative Takana wanted to. Hi, no, um, I, I agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Gallego. Uh, I think the important thing is to stress uh, at the local level, whether it's resolutions passed by uh, city councils, county uh, executive boards, or county boards of supervisors, uh, on a bipartisan basis, uh, that uh, localities, counties, and states cannot borrow money. Only the federal government can. And the relief has to come from the federal government. And the needs are real in terms of public safety. The mm -hmm. needs are real in terms of local schools. Uh, the needs are real in terms of public health and hiring the contact tracing workforce uh, that you're going to need to stand up. Um, testing, testing, testing only works with contact tracing, contact tracing, contact tracing, and you're going to need trusted members of the community to be able to get people who are scared to go see the doctor, who are scared to go shopping who are scared to even go to the food uh, bank. Um, they, need, 
they need trusted voices uh, to be able to reach out to them uh, and get them to trust them, to tell, to, to tell them, who is it that you saw two hours ago now that we know that you've been mm -hmm. infected? So um, that trust is going to be hard to come by. You're going to need federal resources and you're going to need to uh, get your Republican colleagues uh, to turn up the heat. Let me also say something that maybe you don't know about. Um, and this doesn't really answer the question uh, about how do we save the money for second step programs, uh, which are so valuable. But we need to get local and state government relief. The other thing that I want to say is that maybe you don't know that the, that the Veterans Administration has a fourth mission. And that fourth mission is to step in uh, when the local uh, health system is collapsing and breaking down. And the biggest sources of collapses so far have been nursing homes. Um, and often who staffs those nursing homes are people of color, low income, people who have been put on the lowest priority for PPE, but yet their patients, there's like over 300 nursing homes in California where we know that a person has been infected, either a resident or a staff person. We need to get them testing. We need to get them PPE. But in many cases, those, those, those places are going to collapse. They don't have infection control expertise. They may have one doctor on staff who knows nothing about infection control. I do know of one instance where the VA has gone in and helped a prison. And, um, you know, uh, there's this, you, you local legislators need to understand the way in which you get requests in through FEMA. And often uh, you need to get your voices heard by even, say, the local uh, VA medical center director. Uh, they, they do have training, they do have resources, but where you know that there's a crisis happening in a nursing home, but I also think we do need to turn our attention to prisons. Um, and uh, the VA does have expertise and equipment to be able to come in, but it takes the locals to make that request. Excellent. I, I have another question that actually ties, Rachel, to kind of to your, to your last point. Uh, what help and what monitoring is currently happen, happening at the congressional level of the federal prisons to ensure that people in prison are getting the testing and those that have COVID-19 are getting the help that, 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 that they need? Can we, can we unmute, please, someone? All right. Um, yeah, so the, the, um, the mute control is with whoever y'all. So, um, yeah, the, sorry um, about that. So, look, I, 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 can, I don't know what committee has been conducting oversight. Frankly, we haven't been able to have committee meetings. Right. We haven't been able to have oversight meetings. Hopefully, those will ramp up. Um, and uh, as far as oversight of the federal prisons, I imagine that would be under uh, the Judiciary uh, Committee. Um, and certainly uh, 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 detention centers for, for um, ICE, that's a different committee that would be um, you know, probably under Homeland Security. Um, but we do, need to, we do need to get these oversight, uh, oversight uh, done. Uh, I, I think you know, state legislatures um, and their state prison system, to the extent that you can shine a light on these locally. Um, you know, I, I, Karen Bass told me that we're not testing um, uh, prisoners. I can tell you right now that the VA owns uh, its own long-term uh, long care facilities called community living centers. They've been very successful. They were very, in terms of uh, containing or preventing uh, infection. They've been very successful at infection control. And that's because they shut down visitations early. They implemented testing of every single em uh, employee and every resident. Um, and the lessons learned from that point to that we need to do that for every nursing home in the country. We need to make a one third of all deaths are attributed to nursing homes. We need to make the same case for prisons. Um, I've had two deputy sheriffs here in my own county. They are connected with, uh, the, the deputy sheriffs were connected with, um, they, they did work in our local county jails. 
right? Um, and they, that's where they were infected. I have, I've had two law enforcement officials die. Uh, we know that prisoners have been infected. So we need to have uh, somehow to drive also this focus on every employer, uh, every, employ, uh, every employee, um, every law enforcement official, everybody uh, within the prison system needs to be tested. We're talking about doing that in the VA system for our community living centers, or otherwise known as long-term care facilities, on a weekly basis. And we're getting to the point where the 300,000 plus VA workforce, anybody, any employee who wants to be tested can get tested. Yeah. There's no national testing plan, yes. no leadership that's necessary. I mean, um, I'm very sure. pleased the VA is doing sure. that, but we need to do that for the prison system. Thank you so much, Representative Takano. My next question is from State Senator Erica Geis from the great state of Michigan. I'm sorry, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, Erica is the first vice chair of Michigan Legislative Black Caucus. Her question has to do with the fact that a large number of black and brown people serving in childcare positions, how do we ensure that as the workplace reopens, that the funding continues to ensure mitigating strategies uh, will, will happen to protect not only the kids, but also the workers? Uh, that the testing and the PPEs, how, how, how do we ensure that the resources get to the people on the ground who are putting their lives at risk uh, by reopening? Um, I would say um, a lot of that is going to be predicated upon what you all are able to negotiate um, within your budget. So I, I know every state has operates on a different budget cycle. Um, <clears throat> some states do two-year budgets, but certainly that is an issue worth drawing the line on. Yeah. And one of the things that we're doing is we're in, in Illinois, so for example, in Illinois, we are on, um, our budget has to be done by the end of this month, May 31st, constitutionally. And there are issues that are non-starters. So if our votes are desired for a budget, they will, there, there are non-starter issues that must be represented in that budget. And so when thinking about um, child care and who is in child care, I know, so about three years ago, um, the former governor at the time, there was this huge stalemate here in Illinois. And uh, we, went almost, we went over two years without a budget. And one of the pieces on the board that they were looking to move around at the chess piece in this larger game was child care. And in one executive order, uh, 178,000 children across the state lost childcare. And what we saw in that was that it just wasn't black and brown women that ran childcare facilities. And I think that that may have been a perception. There were folks all over the state that were impacted because of childcare. But what we clearly saw was the vast overrepresentation in terms of um, places where black, in particular, black and brown women are able to be entrepreneurs and who works in those facilities. And so, when thinking about the, the move to reopen, clearly these childcare facilities are gonna need massive amounts of PPE. They're gonna need massive amounts of sanitation equipment because of the yes. inability to socially distance. Um, all of those things are going to require resources. And so that is going to have to be um, committed to um, either through state appropriations or through identifying the DPA funds that we've been talking about. Identifying those funds that have already come to your state and then directing them through a state appropriation to be able to directly go through um, and be able to protect those that are um, charged with loving on and taking care of our babies on a daily basis. Wonderful. Thank you, Leader Bruce. Um, th this will be my last question. And then I, I see the Lieutenant Governor in the great state of Michigan has joined us and we'll go to him uh, to, to close us out. Uh, but the, the last question just has to do with uh, telemedicine. Um, uh, how will telemedicine be used? How have we invested more in telemedicine to decrease health disparities uh, and, and mental health challenges uh, that we've seen as a result of COVID-19 um, in communities of color? Like how are, 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 is telemedicine specifically in uh, the CARES and HEROES if so, if not, how can we ensure they get invested in properly so people get the help that they need? Uh, 
Um, Represent Gallego, Represent Takano. Hi, uh, could just re uh, the could just repeat the question. It, ha it, ha it has to do with uh, what we're seeing on the ground, and this is why I resonate with this question. What we're seeing on the ground is the increased need of telemedicine, whether it be for people with COVID nineteen or people with mental health challenges. They they, they need uh, te 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 telecommunication in order to get their needs met. And so, is there something built into uh, cares or heroes uh, that specifically uh, bolsters te the telemedicine um, and for, for and, and when resources get to the state level, how can we ensure that 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 telemedicine resources actually get to the people on the ground? Um, the CARES Act is about eighteen hundred pages. Um, yeah. I don't, uh, and it's so much to put my arms around. What I'll do is I'll make sure that uh, we get that information to you. Okay. Uh, whether it's embedded in how we're going to administer expanded Medicaid or Medicaid, uh, there may be something in there. I can tell you at the VA uh, that we have expanded telemedicine and we've had to you know, work with veterans um, uh, in terms of getting them equipment and to, to facilitate more telemedicine because they've, they've uh, you know, uh, stopped regular kinds of, of visitations only for COVID-19 related. They're, they're slowly opening up in certain parts of the country. Um, but if you, if you will, I do want to kind of, I saw a question that, that really got me going uh, as it was posted in the chat box, but it had to do with, uh, is social distancing a privilege? And I think that is such a great question because it is a privilege. Because when you think about it, essential workers haven't been laid off. They don't have the choice not to go to work. They can't just not show up because they can't qualify for the unemployment, right? So they have to work. And um, if we don't have provide them with the protections, uh, health and safety protections at work, and we don't pay them hazard pay, uh, that's, really a, that's really an injustice. And it's ironic when you think about that, uh, that the vectors, the early vectors for this disease globally were people who could travel on international airplanes uh, and cruise ships. Um, and had a lot of money, and, and um, that's, that's how this disease, by and large, got introduced, not through low-income folks. Uh, you don't see low-income folks traveling around on cruise ships uh, or even in coach seats. I see the lieutenant governor has is, is, is got his sound and is ready. Maybe, maybe he can answer that last question. I want to yield, yield to him. Should I go ahead? Yes, please. Welcome. All right. All right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here on this call. Thank you uh, to the Alliance. I want to um, uh, especially thank my brother Aswa from Detroit. Um, always <laughs> good to have uh, the state of Michigan represented on a leadership team. Um, I want to thank um, uh, the state representative, uh, Gordon Booth from, um, from Illinois. I want to thank U.S. Representative Takano. Uh, I really appreciate your words and really you um, you really put the ball on the tee for a lot of things that are really important as far as how we need to respond to COVID-19 as a nation, but also what we need to do on the state level uh, to make sure that um, we are taking care of our people. And I appreciate how uh, ASJ is really at the forefront of making sure that people come first. And in, Mich in the state of Michigan, that's what's driving our policy decisions, people, because our people are our most important, our most valuable uh, resource an asset and they always need to come first. And especially when we're dealing with public health and a public health emergency, all our choices need to be made in the best interest of people. And whenever we're talking about any kind of re-engaging of any kind of activity, we need to make sure that it's done in a way that will enable people to be safe. And that's the only thing that needs to drive our choices. There's no conversation about the economy without talking about people's safety and people's confidence. And that's really what this is all about. Um, Representative Scano mentioned some pieces about um, 
public safety, especially when it comes to prisons and jails. And I want to speak to that directly. So uh, in the state of Michigan, we were one of the first and, and remain one of the few states that has reported out its uh, coronavirus test results and COVID-19 deaths along racial and ethnic lines. And that's really important because you can't really respond to a problem that you can't see and can't measure. And by making that data uh, transparently available so the public people could see how critically, how critical and how large the racial disparities were in terms of the infections and deaths. In Michigan, to put it in perspective, we represent, Black people represent 14% of the population and 40% of the people who have passed away from COVID-19. And so the governor set up, and I'm the chair of the Michigan Coronavirus Task Force on Racial Disparities, and we're looking at a number of ways to decrease that um, infection rate and mortality rate disparity. Now, one of the important um, pieces that we have been looking at in the state of Michigan is what we're doing in our Department of Corrections, our prisons, and then also in our county jail systems across the state. Um, about, a, about a week ago, once we really got our testing capacity um, up to a level where we could support it, we set out to test every every person who was incarcerated in the state of Michigan. Testing, as you've heard many times in this call, is the front door to treatment. And one of the the the, the biggest issues with not having a national testing strategy or a national strategy on coronavirus response period is that we had very limited capacity when it came to testing kits and testing kit components in our state, just like every other state. And that meant that there needed to be choices made about who got tested and who didn't. And often when there are chances to make choices, bias is present and that bias often works against people of color, low income people, people who have other health challenges, people who have, who have a lower educational attainment and all sorts of issues. And also people frankly who are incarcerated despite the fact that they are quite vulnerable. Well, once we got our capacity to level, we could support it in partnership with our Michigan National Guard, we've worked to test every person who's been incarcerated in the state of Michigan, now giving them access to, to care. Um, we also are gonna test every person who was in a jail in Michigan. Now, while doing that testing, that's important in terms of connecting people to treatment, but we also need to send people home. And that's why we've, we've been able to use our parole board to more than double the rate at which we're sending people home safely um, to places where they can be safe, because it's a whole lot safer at home than it is in prison. And we've recommended to every jail in the state that they would also um, release people who were in there for stuff like failure to appear or failure to pay or traffic violation or their pretrial in a way that's, but in a way that um, manages and maintains public safety. Um, we also have been taking measures to do things like let every medical provider know that medical bias may be present in how they're making choices. We've established a non-discrimination policy in terms of how testing and treatment is administered um, for our Department of Health and Human Services. There was a question about telemedicine earlier, and we actually, through an emergency executive order, have expanded um, access to telemedicine services so that they can be paid for by Medicaid in our state, which was not um, something that was possible before. Because again, we need to make sure people can get connected to care. And one of the things that this task force is looking at is one of the reasons why this virus has been so deadly to people of color and the people who are living in persistent poverty is because of our lack of connection to the healthcare system due to systemic racist barriers. Due to there not being doctors and primary care physicians available in our neighborhoods, to health insurance being so expensive that many of us are uninsured or underinsured and just not having a doctor in the first place. So we have a work group of medical professionals and public health experts who are looking at how we can use the fact that during this coronavirus pandemic, people are coming into contact with a doctor for the first time or for the first time in a long time. How can we use that contact point to connect them with a primary care physician going forward in a sustainable way? Because if we do that, then that will enable people to set preventative health plans for themselves and for their family members. That will enable them to be able to manage the chronic conditions that have proven to be so deadly when mixed with the coronavirus, like uh, high, high blood pressure and diabetes and asthma. As I, and I'm talking about asthma, which is something that's really important here in the state of Michigan. As I sit here in my home in, De home in Detroit, next door to the zip code with the highest prevalence of asthma in the state of Michigan. And that is a zip code that is lived in almost exclusively by black and Latino Michiganders. So how can we create these connections to care in ways that will keep people more safe? Um, uh, another point is for those, uh, uh, Congressman Connell again talked about how frontline workers who are working during this time are risking their lives because they have to. But we need to make sure that they're actually protected at work. That's why we have a member of the labor movement um, represented on our, the labor movement is represented on our task force 
because for the, we need workplace protocols and worker protections and to make sure there's a safety net to catch workers. It's hazard pay. It's paid sick leave. It's knowing that you won't go broke if you test positive and you can get access to treatment and not have to worry about um, the cost the cost that it may um, that, that your family may encumber as a result of that diagnosis. So these are the things that we're trying to put in place in Michigan and then build upon them going forward, connecting more people to the internet, dealing with the fact that dealing with the fact that kids are learning at a distance now for the first time and that's difficult if you don't have internet access, making sure that testing can truly be accessible to our most vulnerable populations by, do, by building on the innovative partnership between Wayne State University of Detroit and Ford Motor Company's Mobility Innovation Unit, Ford X, that literally will drive a van full of tests to a neighborhood and park and test a thousand people in a day because we know that neighborhood or that zip code is one of the, um, one of the peak areas for infection rates. These are the things that we're trying to do in Michigan, and we really think that these can be replicated all over the country. But the only way that that can happen is, well, there's two pieces that we need. One is we need the full support of the federal government. I'm so thankful that Congress, uh, that, that the U.S. House of Representatives have done the right thing and passed a bold and aggressive agenda through the HEROES Act. And we certainly are working through our delegation to make sure that as much of that can be get signed into law as possible. But we, and when I say we, I mean leaders at every level, the community level, the municipal level, and the state level, need to work with partners and allies in the states to ensure that our advocacy is in sync, to ensure that we are responding to the needs of the communities that we live in and that we serve. And there is no better ally that is better positioned to do that in communities across the country, including in the great state of Michigan, than ASJ. I can't thank the Alliance for Safety and Justice enough for the work that you do, for the rigor that you bring to the work, but you match that rigor with passion and conscientiousness and humanity. And I think that's the kind of advocacy that we all need and we all can appreciate as we work toward this future where we all have a pathway to health, where we all have a pathway to education, where we all have a pathway to justice and all have a pathway to safety. We only get that when we take care of one another. And the truth, y'all, is that the irony of everything that we're doing now to respond to this pandemic, the social distancing, the pausing of activity, all of that really just reminds us how connected we truly are. It magnifies the power and the value of our relationships. That's why during this time, when we all have had to take this pause, for or those of us who've been able to do so, I want you to make sure that you're checking in on and checking in with your people because we need one another. In order to get through this, we need one another. In order to confront whatever we'll face on the other side of this, we need one another. And so on the, uh, once we come through this pandemic, we know that we will be closer to one another. We'll say, I love you a little harder. We'll take care of one another better. We'll be more conscientious. And that will lead to more effective advocacy. That will lead to policy change. And that will be the bright ray of sunshine that greets us on the other side of this stormy night. So um, thank you for having me here on this call. Thank everyone for their participation and being beacons of information in the communities that you live in and represent because we need positive, solid, factual, credible information and leadership in such a time as this. Thank you so much, Mr. Lieutenant Governor. Thank you to Representative Karen Bass, Ruben Gallego, Mark Takano, Jordan, Leader Gordon Booth, and Mr. Gilchrist. It's so amazing to see leadership at times like this. Thank you for the time you spent with us and thank you for what you're doing for the country. Thanks y'all, God bless.